Clark, could you turn off your video? And we are now being recorded. So welcome to the STIR interim meeting, um, first of 2020. We'll see if we have more as we go along. Our first order of business is to note that this meeting is operating under the note well. If you're not familiar with the note well, please take some time to familiarize yourself with it before you contribute to this meeting. Our agenda today is on the screen. Our first order of business is to find the minute takers, Jabber scribe, and to again point people at the blue sheets. Um, some people are having issues connecting to UPAD, keep trying. Um, several people have been able to uh, attach. Um, we've got a few people that have already added their name to the blue sheet there. Um, see if you can get in before the meeting's over and add yourself. If you can't, um, send me email and I will take care of it um, at the end of the meeting. I do not yet have a minute taker. Do we have someone on the call who is willing to take uh, notes? We don't, we don't need a blow by blow. We are being recorded. We just need a quick sketch of decisions that were taken. Anybody else? I'll do it. I'll do it. Let's right. not hang up on this. Sure. Um, do we have a volunteer to watch the uh, the Jabber room? My experience from running another one that was totally virtual was that didn't really need to happen because we're all virtual. No. All right. I think we can uh, get the Jabber subscribe. Everyone can watch. Right. Take yeah. care of everybody else. All right, so our plan is to go through our active working documents. Um, if we get through those, we can update on our documents that are in working group last call and post working group last call. And if we have time remaining, we've got um, three um, drafts that the um, presenters would like to, to tell us about and start to close issues in those if, if the group wants to, to jump in. So, anybody have any agenda bashes before we start? So, let's go ahead and move to RCD. Let's make sure that we get Chris online. Don't, Chris, are you with us? I don't think I see you in the roster. Ping him real quick. Hey guys, this is Murray. Was that was um, Stir Passport divert on the agenda? I'm sorry. Yes, it's in the updates on post working group last call documents. Perfect. Thank you. So I guess while we're waiting, do we have Martin? I'm, uh, I'm texting with Chris. Let me, let me see if I can get him here. Yeah, I don't see either one of them, so I think we'll just have to push these to the uh, to later and see if they join. Yeah. All right. Well, John, as soon as you finish um, getting your ping in with Chris, let's go ahead and work through our updates, and then we can come back and hit the active documents. That makes sense. Um, we'll see if he. He replies here. Yeah, we'll do these. It'll be fun and exciting. And just let me know when to advance. I will do so. Um, so yeah, we uh, next slide. We can talk about three docs here. Hopefully, um, this won't be too complicated or controversial. Um, so the good news is, two of those documents, uh, the out of band doc and the divert doc, have progressed out of the working group. And in fact, OB is in the RFC editors queue at the moment. 
So that one is proceeding, which is good because as a lot of people here know, there's kind of a lot of talk about OB these days. And so it's probably good that we're getting that one off the plate. Um, I'm not going to say too much about what's going on with the state of that one now, obviously, though, if we have time later, we will be talking a bit about the service provider out of band um, draft that I submitted as an individual for this one. Um, as for divert, so divert went to the ISG uh, quite recently. Um, there are a few issues there, though. Um, some, most of them, I'd say, concern div o, um, the idea of using div in this nested fashion with the um, the opt uh, former passport inserted into it. And I'll talk a bit about these in another slide. Um, but Benjamin um, also raised an issue about hiding the original called number by not including a div passport. Kind of, kind of what the security implications are. If you really do want to obscure what the original called number was, because you want to obscure whatever like service logic you're using for forwarding, you know, kind of what 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 the results of that really are, and so there probably is some text that we need to add it for that. And he had a ton of minor comments, like like quite a slew um, that we'll have to work through here. And as well, um, just the, the reviewers, including the IANA review, found a number of nits and editorials that need to be fixed as well. I'll go through a few of those now. So next slide. Right, so div o. So div, the div o text that's in the diversion draft is frankly a bit of a stub. So it defines this new passport option for div o. And this is something really you mostly use for out of band. This is not something we expect would be used for, for in band um, SIP based uh, diversion where you know, our assumption is that you're able to add an additional passport, um, probably in a new identity header, right? And that it's up to the verification service, to the relying party on the terminating side, to be able to correlate the diversion passports that are stored in these identity headers with the, um, the original passport and kind of figure out the chain between them. Um, you know, DIVO doesn't have that luxury. DIVO assumes you're either at a CPS and it'll be case or you're using some sort of non-SIP protocol in any event that doesn't have that ability to carry multiple identity headers and for people to be able to sort it out on the end. Um, and I mean, I think the main thing that Benjamin raised is, and actually both Benjamin and Roman raised this in the reviews, there's, there's kind of no particular ASBS behavior that's described for them in the draft today. And partly I think it's that the division of labor between this document and OB is, is perhaps unclear in that regard, since OOB goes to great lengths to kind of discuss, okay, this is what's different about an AS and a BS, an authentication service and a verification service in these out of band cases. And so we would probably need to specify DIVO a bit more here in order to um, make Ben and Roman and probably the implementation community um, happy about that. And so, I mean, that, that though would not be a small lift. That would be the kind of lift where I imagine um, this would probably have to come back to the working group afterwards because it would be the addition of a considerable amount of, of normative text um, to that section. And, you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to do that, but I, I think we should probably float that here. So if people have an opinion about, you know, the, the perspective value of doing this at this point, because for better or for worse, and I understand there are a lot of people who feel it's for the worse, there does seem to be more buzz, more traction. There's actually implementations deployment of out of band at the moment. And so because of that, um, you know, probably having a diversion story for it makes sense. And we, it's probably worth the investment of a bit more energy in this. But I wanted to stop and just ask if you had any comments on kind of how, whether we should go forward and specify more of div O. John, could I ask if at the end of the meeting you go ahead and, and send that same question to the list for the few folks who couldn't be here? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I, obviously I still need to reply to those reviews which are relatively relatively new. Um, it's just that the problem is there's like a lot of stuff to reply to, especially in bands, <laughs> and so it's a, my my draft meal for that is already pretty long. But any any thoughts from the group on this? Well, with no hats on, I will um, agree with you that the state of actual industry and deployment is such that it would behoove us to put more effort into adding dimension to what we have documented. 
Yeah, it's, that's my intuition as well, unfortunately, because it kind of seems like a lot of work. But um, if that work is going to live somewhere, since OB is already in the RC editor queue, you know, from a division of labor perspective, it probably belongs in this draft. And I, I mean, the good news is OB does really talk a lot about what OB, ASs, and BSs do in general. And so we can kind of build on that text. You know, I mean, it, because OB is informational and this is PS, you know, there's a certain amount of do we want to have normative things pointing to behavior of OB, and that's mildly annoying from a process perspective. So probably I'll have to just make a lot of normative statements about this um, to kind of compensate for that in the, the div draft. And it will, it'll add some text. It's not going to add like a huge amount of text, but it, it'll definitely be adding some text here. All right, so I'll, I'll adopt that as a rough direction, hearing no opposition to it. Uh, we also want to make it more explicit. This is something I think Ben and, and others raised. You know, what, what like OPT actually stands for, and it stands for Original Passport. Um, so we'll, we'll do that. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other kind of minor fixes that are incumbent on what the intended scope and definition of OPT is that we can, we can add to this based on the reviews. Next slide. Pretty exciting. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. OK, so um, ITF stir cert delegation finished working group last call. Russ, thank you very much for your comments on that. Basically, I'm just have, I'm, I'm accepting all those comments, Russ, and there's nothing, nothing there that I think we really need to go through in any detail. I mean, I was talking about like the eight kid skid chaining. Right. I mean, re really, all I was trying to say is that, like, the order of the certificates in the PEM document should correspond to the order in which the, the you know, ICID and SCID, like, like actually link the certs together. <laughs> and I, I don't know if there's already a word for how the path should correspond to that. I mean, it's, it's kind of like an obvious thing to say. And it's, it's probably, you know, really also just like an optimization, right? It's, it's not like you couldn't figure this out yourself if the certificates in that PEM chain were out of order, out of that order. It's not that you couldn't, you know, somehow extrapolate that and figure it out. But um, so is, is there like no word for that already? <laughs> I mean, you could say something, Ted, this is Sean Turner. You could say something in effect from the signer to the root. I mean, there's, you could provide more information for the, for the implementers, but you're absolutely right is that it's, the blob of search is there. Once they start processing these things, you're going to know from the issuer subject name who's what. Yeah, I mean, I, but I was just saying, wouldn't wouldn't it be nice if they were like in the right order <laughs> to start with, so you didn't have to, you know, kind of figure out, oh, the fourth one down is actually the first one or something. But so there's, I there's, guess there's, no, there's no name for like organizing a PEM chain that way already. I'll have to think of it, but I mean, there there is some. Because usually, like in CMS, it's just a cert blob, and they actually called it that, right? It's just a blob of certs. Yeah. So there, I'll have to look and see if there's some other wording that has been used throughout the thing. Because you know, even if you don't put them in an order, you're still going to end up having to check that order. So it's true. Well, further, uh, this is Russ. The the issue is that some validators may have a different trust anchor in some PKIs, especially where there's cross certification. In this one, we don't have that problem. Yeah. So there ought to be um, some way to say that, but I can't think of any RFC that defines such a word. Yeah, I mean, the problem is we don't, we don't really want the RFC to be, you know, predicating how trust anchors are organized in deployment. It just so happens trust anchors are organized in deployment this way. <laughs> right. So, right. Exactly. So we can know that there's a facilitating assumption we're making, even if, like, you know, it's, it's not you something we're But you say organize from the trust anchor towards the signer? Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds good. Could you, could you write that down, too, just, just so we know exactly what the right word for it is? Yeah. That'd be good. Just put it in, like, the chapter or something. Um, sure. And I'll, I'll patch it in. Everything else that you suggested is fine. Um, that, that was the only one where it's kind of like, yeah, I, I just don't know what the right word is. But yeah, I mean, so uh, I think next slide. I think we're, we're pretty much through all this now. Yeah, so um, we, we should probably fix this divo stuff and cycle back both to the working group and to the ISG. Um, you know, I'll issue a zero nine to, to reflect that. 
Um, and then, you know, we'll do a revision of delegation, I think, to incorporate the fixes that Russ asked for in that and advance that to the ISG. And those, those would be our next steps. Any further thoughts, comments, ideas on delegation? No, sounds like we've got the plan. All right. um, how you doing, Robert? Sorry about that. This showed up as at uh, two o'clock on my calendar. Yeah, everything I sent out had it at 9.30. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know how it did, but uh, anyway, sorry. All right, so um, Martin, thank you though. So you joined at a really good time. We'll jump back and, and go through the, the uh, working group draft that you have in progress now. Um, let me get to that slide. It should be here, yes. And I haven't heard from Chris on, uh, on a texting. So like if force comes source, I can just do RCD. It's, it's fine, I'm sure. All right, well, if we get to the end of this one, then um, we'll ask you to do so. So let yeah, me Robert, Robert, okay, so I, we can actually jump to slide four because slide two and three are really, you know, background and they've been presented before. It's just kept in there for the purposes of completeness. Sure. So before we jump into this slide, let me remind everyone again to try to get to the Etherpad, um, sign into the blue sheet that's there. If the Etherpad refuses to let you in, just send me email and I'll make sure that your name gets added. Um, so go ahead, Martin. Okay, so um, since the meeting in November, um, we, you know, we received some <clears throat> editorials and <clears throat> we did editorial cleanup um <clears throat> we added a pointer for um you know to a reference for um support of the um you know the the service url which is the sos um and uh, uh we're waiting on feedback from brian rosen uh on uh, on getting that um reference um as a next step um you know with respect to anonymous you know we had a conference call and that's still an open uh item and um how to um you know uh, address anom anonymous um this is something that is also going to be discussed in 3gpp um and is currently right now um in stir shaken um carriers are supporting um you know you know basically uh you know you know verifying anonymous and um they are passing that um now unfortunately um, because this never really got standardized, um, everybody, from what we could tell, is not everybody, but I mean, um, there's various variant implementations of how to encode um, anonymous in a URL, and um, carriers will at this time are like normalizing for what. Uh, their network expects, um, and so you know, and so that is an item that does um, need attention. And then the last thing is the unregistered UE, and again, this was discussed on the conference call. And so um, after this meeting, we need to, or if we can get some feedback here, um, that's an item that needs to be. Um, uh, 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 addressed. And then lastly, um, we need more eyes to review the document, um, and that would be greatly appreciated. And so that's basically it, Robert. All right, I will issue uh, uh, a call for um, you know, explicit volunteer reviewers. Um, 
on the list at the end of the meeting. I think we're still a little bit away from the point where we would want to working group last call this. Um, do you have a feel for uh, just in, in your mind what the timeline is for closing these items that you've identified that, that need a, a little bit more text where we where it would be reasonable to working group last call the document? Is that going to be in the next month or so, or, or is it going to be more than that? Um, I, I think in fairness, um, it would likely be, you know, sometime, you know, maybe July, a couple of months out. All right, we'll, we'll set that as a plan. All right, Martin, thank you. Um, if we still haven't heard from Chris, John, and Genka will step things back up and, and let you start working us through um, RCD. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so we do have a new rev of RCD. Um, this is something that's also getting a fair amount of industry attention at the moment. And, you know, I think there's still um, some things the industry is chewing on in general about kind of how, how they want to do this, what 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 constraints they want to put around it, what actors they think should be helping to generate RCD. Um, but, you know, this this is something where I think this is going to start moving forward this year. I have heard about RCD in the wild um, being used to attest this stuff. Um, so this this is getting kind of increasingly important that we probably look, try to lock this down in the near term. Um, the major update here is an interesting one, which is the addition of the, the CRN claim, which corresponds to a reason um, or a string as it is representing the intent for a call. And this, this is a, a big component of this. We, we put together a corresponding update to the SIPCOR draft for this on, on using call info for this function. And this, this reflects kind of what our strategy has been recently for RCD, which is to look at RCD as something that is really signing what's in call info. And you know this this kind of reflects the way we've looked at passport in general as you know um, a signature that duplicates or or signs over some elements of the SIP request. And rather than just having RCD be a completely kind of one-off thing that only appears in passports, probably we should be defining the way that we want these this sort of rich call data to appear in SIP in general, and then say here's how you sign it with a passport. And um, call reason was an interesting one of these. We, do we have a slide on call reason? I, I, I don't actually remember looking at this deck if we do or not. Can you go to the next slide? Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the call reason claim um, conveys the caller's intention in contacting the callee. And you know, looking at this, it was kind of fun for me, looking back at SIP and looking at like, what, what do we think the subject um, field of like a SIP request means? Like would subject suffice for this? And um, there are a variety of reasons why I think probably we want something new or one-off just given what the historical usages or lack thereof of subject have been. Um, and instead have something that's just a string that we can stick into the call info itself as an additional parameter that defines why somebody is placing this call. So for example, if this is a restaurant that's calling you, it could be to confirm your reservation will be listed in that reason field. And the idea is that that is something that the user agents themselves could ultimately have a way to access. And what that is is a complicated question. You know, there's a lot of um, controversy, I'd say, still about exactly how much data from a passport is going to end up making its way down to the UEs at the end of the day. And um, we think that um, doing that with subject, for example, because subject historically has not been something that's just like rendered to a UE didn't make sense. We, we'd want to define a new field that has the security property associated with it, that it can be signed so you know that you're getting a proper attestation of it from the, um, the originator of the call. That'll convey this reason. And should there be constraints on it? Should you be able to prevent people from putting in you know, bad language, whatever the reason, you know, what are the internationalization aspects of it? There's a lot of things to work out that subject really never had to do. And so, yeah, we're look, we're targeting a new field for that now. And that field corresponds to this, this CRN claim. Uh, we, we do want to make it extensible though, um, so that we can support more structured data in the future. If we wanted this to be, again, for internationalization, where we want to trigger off of a language indicator and maybe render one of a set of strings that are available, um, even have some things you could act on more programmatically 
uh, if we wanted to invent categories of call reasons, for example, and to have those uh, rendered in different ways to the UE at the end of the day. That, that's kind of the basic idea behind the CRM claim. But this is new, so please read it and give us feedback. I guess to start from the start, do people kind of get what that's for? Um, do people get why subject probably is a good fit? Or people want to push back and say, no, we should use the subject. Um, and any thoughts about this? Uh, this is Brian. I, 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 I approve. I think that this is the right thing to do. I think subject is so problematic. We basically have to redefine what subject was in order to make it useful. I yeah. think using call info is the right way. You, you might want to think ahead a little bit in the kind of directions you're, you're going where it might get more complex and allow the kind of body, you know, allow it to be in a body or a URL. Um, if, if it gets really complex, body probably yeah. more usefully. So content indirect in the call info that points to a body in the message. Yeah, and I mean, because this is like really, the, the, this is the first draft we've articulated this in. I, I don't think we've, we've thought through a lot of that yet, but um, that, that makes sense to me to be able to point to CID or something. Yeah, we're, we're using those mechanisms, using call info in several other places uh, especially in emergency calls, there's very wide use of that particular mechanism, URI in a call info header with a specific purpose and pointing to a body or sometimes a URL. So I, I think that that's a very good way of handling a more complex data structure. Uh, Brian, um, it, maybe you could discuss this offline, but could you point me to where that's documented and used today? Yeah, I can. Yeah, and Thank you. a link to the, the RFC, at least, uh, not to the deployment, yeah. to the RFC, is in this call info uh, draft that we put out, um, which is a SIP core draft. It's not a year draft, although, of course, I right. still need to go like right to SIP core and tell them <laughs> that it's there. Um, yeah, yeah, you should do that. <laughs> the only difference between what we're doing here and what is documented in that um, call info for emergency services draft is the namespace, right? It's just because that namespace is defined around emergency. We're just kind of like not using that namespace, but otherwise it's basically the same mechanism, so. <laughs> so one quick question. Um, is there, has there been a discussion yet about the difference between a, a, a commercial entity using this and a, a government authority using it? Does, is there anything in the mechanism that cares who the source is or is that all tied into the root? I mean, it's all tied into the trust, yeah, the trust anchor. I mean, who you trust for this. Um, this is not intended to replace the call into mechanism that's in the emergency draft, which contains all that kind of good stuff you want for uh, attesting who the source is of emergency communications. This is much more for, for the enterprise, frankly, case, or maybe to some degree the consumer case, but I don't imagine consumers are gonna have access to systems that let them attest a call reason, say. Um, they could, I guess in the long term, but. So anyway, that's, uh, that's CRN. Uh, why, don't, why don't we move on? No other comments on CRN. Here's just an example of CRN um, for your ears only, James Bond. And uh, yeah, so that this, this shows um, kind of the, the, the two approaches as well to RCD that we're working off of today. Um, we, if you look at the RCD element there, you'll see it has two child elements, this, this, uh, this uh, name field that points to what is effectively the display name that would appear in the from or the PS3 identity header, and then this notion that there is a JCard provided um, by reference linking out to where you can get the full JSON object that would contain um, all this interesting material. One important thing to note about this, and this is a security decision that we made um, very intentionally, that, that RCDI hash, which, you know, covers the RCD element itself and makes sure that you get, you know, kind of an attestation that that hasn't been in any way modified, say, if the contents of that, that J card um, that is there by reference been modified, the hash would detect that. CRN is very intentionally not in that hash. And the intention of this was you have an enterprise, let's say it is American Express or something that is calling you, 
because RCDI can be linked to the JWT constraints that appear in the CERT themselves that restrict what the value of RCDI could be for a particular signer, we wanted to make sure that CRN was independent of that so that American Express could kind of interpose, you know, or maybe we'll use Comcast as a better example here. Comcast is rolling a truck and they're sending a particular agent. You know, you want to be able to show what the reason is for that agent appearing. That stuff is not covered by the signature, but the things that tell you who the agent is and gives you their picture and all that, those things are all bound up within RCDI. So there was a security decision that we're making here of where to put CRN. And if people want to push back on this and say instead, no, we really think CRN should be covered by the same hash signature as the remainder of RCD, that would be an interesting discussion to have if anybody feels that way. We thought it made sense to keep it outside of that signature protection so that that is something that enterprises could choose more dynamically. You wouldn't have to get a new cert issued, in other words, to be able to assert a new reason. Anybody think we're wrong? Anybody think we're right? <laughs> uh, this is Brian again. Um, the thing that I don't like about this, and it's not clear that this isn't the right thing. I'm, it, it probably is, but um, as, as I mentioned, there are other uses for call info and protecting them would be really useful. And so this mechanism is tied to the specific uses of call info that you're defining. That's and true. it would be nice if we could cover other uses of call info Possibly with an extension. I'm not saying it has to be here, but let's think about other because we're using call info in other circumstances. It would be really nice if there was a, a relatively straightforward way to cover those. Um, you're right, and we should talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I I guess it would come down to the same that the interesting question about how to protect things from passport for RCD is this RCDI and its connection to the JWT constraints in the certificate that is signing it. Is that yeah. a constraint, a valuable constraint, you think, for the emergency cases? Like, would you want to restrict, you know, I mean, again, this is designed to constrain, right, an enterprise yeah. from misrepresenting itself from, yeah. you know, a, a, a small hardware store in, you know, Tallahassee from claiming that it is, in fact, Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, yeah. do you run into that uh, in the emergency services space? Or yes, that yes. I, I, I think you do. And, and, and therefore, I think you prob we probably want to think about uh, uh, something that, that is as, as strong as our CDI and maybe more extensible. I mean, maybe, maybe we just come up with a pattern and then say for any use case, you have to, you know, fill in the specifics of your pattern. But um, uh, here, here's an example, right? You, you may have an IoT device that reports a radiation uh, accident. And if it could say, I have a radiation accident the size of the city of Wichita, that's bad. Um, uh, so, so, you know, where did this come from? And, um, you know, what, what are we allowing from you is definitely a concern, definitely the kind of thing we want to have more control, not less control of. Uh, so, you know, that argues for the mechanism is right and maybe a little bit more generic way of applying it. Yeah. Okay. No, so that's John, John, this is Russ. Um, this example highlighted something to me. This, uh, when you say it's a string, um, how are we going to accommodate non-English strings? Yeah. So, I mean, there's some text about this. Story. So, the, the basic idea is we'll start with I want to start with something simple that is going to address, um, you know, the the 85% use case of what people want to use it for today. But there is text in there that addresses how you would put a, a more complex data structure into CRN specifically to accommodate this. And as Brian was saying, it would probably involve a layer of interaction where that's pointing to a URL, the more structured data object with different values for different languages and things like it. Um, like I. The degree to which we need to specify that um, from the get-go, I, I think right now we're just kind of saying, let's create a point of extensibility to address that. Um, but I mean, if people feel like we really do need to address that more from the get-go rather than just creating a point of extensibility. Well, I was just thinking if this was UTF-8, it 
would be um, that a bunch of those cases would not require the redirection. Fair enough. Well, but but here's the issue. The issue is if it, it's not merely if it's UTF-8, it's are you going to have a bunch of language tags that say here's the version, here's the Chinese version, and that UEs are going to consume those and render the one appropriate to the receiving UE. That part I get, but I was just thinking, again, as you said, to address the low-hanging fruit, um, you know, basically the character sets are close in, in a bunch of Latin languages very quickly, you know, not You'd, you'd see, I don't know, Spanish text. If you're an English speaker, you might not be able to digest it, but at least the protocol is great. Yeah, I think I think we do have some text in there about how this should be UTF-8 already. I don't, I don't, I don't remember, but um, I mean, I think it, it devolves back to what the JSON rules are, right? I think the JSON rules are on UTF-8. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it's uh, I'll, I'll look at it. I, I know we did think about this and we talked okay. about it. So I I hope some some appropriate text for that ended up in there. But we need to bring this to SIPCore. I mean, again, all all the call reason stuff that that is just going to devolve back to um, you know what we're putting into call info, and then this really is just replicating and or signing that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, that's where we are with this. Um, we think this helps. We, we, have, we hear a lot of people wanting this reason stuff, and so we figured this, this may be the last major part of this we're going to add. But the core things you see there, the, the RCD stanza and the RCDI stanza, those are the main mechanisms that we're planning on using to kind of secure the display that goes to the end user. And reason is just a little bit of icing on the cake for us that seems necessary. So when do you think this will be ready for our working group last call? Well, I mean, I'd like to say soon. I mean, again, I, I think the, the ideas here are relatively mature. If, if provided people are willing to let us largely punt on what that more extensible format for CRN turns out to be, I think this is quite close. And we also do want to work, I think, a bit, at least talk a bit through with Brian, what it would look like to have a you know, we, and I don't know if that'll be in this document. Although this could be a separate document, Brian. Really, it's going to this because it's not RCD itself. We could make a something that's very close to RCD that would work for the emergency case. Um, I guess the real question of that is just: Do we want to define a one-off of RCDI, or do we want to have a more generic? Um, here's a way to sign a set of elements that are appearing in RCD that is here is a hook for JWT constraints. And instead of just having it be an element called RC RCDI, it could be the JWT hook, right? And yeah. the JWT hook here is RCDI, and here's the hash. And you could also have JWT hook for emergency services, and here's the hash. So it, I mean, if we want to talk about something like that, that would reopen the patient for a bit more surgery. I, I, well, I, I was kind of more wondering how the linkage to SIP4 was going to delay or expedite this. Well, SIP core doesn't have a lot of nits plate, right? No, SIP core is pretty uh, pretty quiet right now. So <laughs> plenty 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 of activity of of available uh, uh, mind share, let's say. Yeah, I mean that said, we do need to do it. I mean, basically, I haven't even started trying to push that there. So it, I agree that'll take some time. I, I think we could probably sketch out how to how to handle other uses of of call info with a, a relatively small amount of work. What kind of surgery this does to the document, I'm not sure yet, but I, it isn't going to be a wholesale replacement. It's just whether a piece of it gets taken out and abstracted into another document, and this is an instance of it, or whether it's just a pattern that we, you know, create another document that looks a lot like this document that covers another case. I don't know, but we can work that out quickly. Yeah, let's, Brian, we'll just, we'll have a call offline about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that's it for this document, unless anybody else has any further comments. Yeah. All right, Eric. Do we have you? Okay, and I, I guess you're driving? Yeah, just let me know when to advance. I'll start you here.
Yeah, I was going to say when. So uh, back in IETF 101, there was a lot of concern over this draft that IANA would be an arbiter of who gets put records in the registry. And on the one hand, that kind of was not the case, but we realized that it doesn't matter, not that it doesn't matter that IANA would be an arbiter, but that we don't need an arbiter. Uh, basically, the realization is if you think that how STIR is actually being used, particularly in combination with Shaken, it's not, oh, there's a good STIR signature, the phone call must be good, uh, nor, oh, there's a bad signature, the phone call must be bad. It's uh, that this is just one more piece of data in the calculation of whether the phone call is good or bad. So for example, uh, in the US uh, for uh, plus one, 202, you know, iConnective and Digi DigiCert, whomever will have uh, an entry in, in the uh, root, uh, root of trust. Uh, and yes, somebody could put in another one by some evil organized crime boss and the point is, is that we're not going to ask IANA to figure out who is allowed and who isn't allowed. It actually would allow the evil registration. I'll talk about that in a, a sec. If you go to the next slide, I think I covered it, but uh, yep, I covered that. So if you go to the next one. Uh, so yes, will they really allow an illegal registration? Not exactly. So IANA, we're not going to ask IANA to figure out who's allowed to put registrations into this uh, registry. Uh, even in the United States, it's going to be very complex because it's not going to be the FCC. You know, the FCC is basically told Addis, go do what you're going to do, and Addis then contracts out. And, and we can't expect Diana to, to follow all that. But what Diana will do is in the spirit of STIR, uh, we eat our own dog food, namely uh, there, uh, and if you look in the draft, you see the mechanisms. They basically uh, have non-reputable identity of who's making the registration, and that goes into the registry, uh, which means it's not up to IANA to figure out if it's, uh, how should we say, a legitimate registration. Uh, but it's up to the user of the registry to, to figure that out. Uh, I thought about it for a moment, and you know, we do have an allergy to having, you know, uh, identifying information in a registry, but then I realized, hey, this is all driven by governments. Uh, you know, th there's not a, uh, you know, the, the, the government of the UK does not need to have it secret who's registering. Uh, so uh, there's no privacy issue there. Um, and then basically the users figure out, you know, if they see a registration by iConnective and a registration by Evil Corp, you know, they can figure out that it should be iConnective. Can we go to the next one? Uh, so we are, again, like with the last draft, we're working with IANA on this. Uh, one thing they pointed out is the current draft says the uh, registration model is first come, first serve. And they pointed out it's not really first come, first serve because there can be multiple entries. Uh, it's kind of a degenerate case of expert review. It's not your typical expert review because, again, we're not going to go, you know, Anna's not going to come to the STIR work group and say, hey, is this person allowed to register, which is your typical expert review. But it could fit into that framework as the expert review is, does it have uh, a good signature on the request? Uh, another open issue is uh, there was a request to have IANA remove expired certificates. Uh, they came back with it. They're not quite sure how it would be operationalized uh, and that we're still talking about. But you know, one question is, you know, is it okay just to leave that up to the registry user, you know, saying that users must check the validity of the retrieved certificate. Um, so that, those were the two open issues that, you know, if we want to talk about it, that's great. I can put these on the list, that's great. 
Or if there are other things, that's great. So this is this is John. Hey. Um, a couple things. So so can you go back a couple slides actually to the one that showed the the first slide, I think. First one. One more. Yeah, this one. Um, so I mean this registry is gonna have country codes and NPAs in it. I, I thought this was for country codes. It's for country codes, except we live, as, as you painfully know, we live in one of the two degenerate country codes. Uh, understood. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So for that case of the 17 entities that are wrapped up in the empire or whatever, in the NEMPA, um, we would need to have something special for that. I got that. So that, that's the only reason this is here? That, 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 that was the first thing I was like. Mm. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, so the only, you know, the, the, the thing I mentioned about this before that, that concerned me was the parallel, obviously, to UMC support at ARPA and kind of what we went through with that. And the notion that effectively, you know, there was going to be a namespace that was going to be governed by the ITF that was going to be able to designate who the nation states were that were responsible for the country codes under that. And, you know, the, what I pointed out last time is the process we ended up going through for that was one where Australia Group 2 and a variety of people who believe that it is in fact their prerogative to identify who those entities are kind of wanted to be engaged in that and there was a liaison process for that as we all know it didn't end particularly smoothly so like the expectation here what i'm taking away from this is that now um we're not proposing to vet who those entities are at all um at the itf and so we're not what we're, the, what we're telling study group two effectively is we're not making a decision about who any of these entities are. This is a first come first serve registry and like whoever can just come in and say, I own country code plus four three. Well, that's just, it is, they don't, uh, and this is how Jim McEachern got over it, is it's not like whoever registers 1202 or 443 or to be uh, uh, political some, you know, 852, uh, it's not whoever gets their first wins. It's, uh, you know, if there are competing entities competing, they probably both will register. And it's not up to the IETF to work that out because, you know, working that out is a highly political thing. So, so if multiple entities come and say, I own plus 87810, just to give what I know is a delicious example, um, our notion is that we'll have multiple records that are in the IANA for 87810, one of which is for the entity that legitimately controls that or maybe which are not, and it's up to relying parties to ultimately decide which of those they trust. That's correct. You know, is it ideal? No, but uh, it's, in a sense, it's a lot better than the alternative. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this this is something I think it's it's above my pay grade to decide whether the INS should be directed to do things like that. But I mean, I, I, I honestly can't predict what the results of that would be. I mean, the results that could be that, you know, 10,000, 20,000 people register plus 8, 7, 8, 10. Uh, to say that 10 or 20,000 people what? All register that they're, they're the authority for 8, 7, 8, 10. Uh, yeah, and again, on the one hand, they can, but also remember to to make the registrate. And, and yes, very easily you can get yourself a recognized S mine certificate and all that. And I suppose ten thousand people could go through that effort. Uh, and it's in the registry who's made those registrations. So this is Alyssa Cooper. Can you hear me? Okay. Could I do what? Can you hear me? I guess you can. <laughs> uh, so one thing I was wondering about, Eric, actually in the draft itself, it doesn't specify this bit about the contact information or it doesn't actually say what information about the registrant is supposed to be included. You talked about it um, in the slide, but didn't actually see it in the draft. Do you yeah. have... A notion of what information exactly that would be. Yeah, let me pull that up. Uh, Maybe I just missed it. And shame on me for not having this right in front of me, but uh, is um, 
Uh, it's, it was uh, just the domain. Okay, so there isn't actually uh, a person. It's not a contact person or a telephone number or whatever, because okay. again, you get back into, well, you get into a couple of practical things. One is uh, it might literally not be a person. Uh, and again, we don't want to burden IANA with trying to figure out you know what's what it's just basically they either get an email or we can do it you know they and we're again we're talking with michelle and kim about you know how to operationalize this okay yeah my other question was if you know just from talking to them if there's other registries that they administer where they do domain validation i haven't talked to them about that but that's an obvious question <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 is, because if it was a precedent, it would be helpful because yeah. I think for them, I mean, I think it's always useful to try to shield them as much as possible from um, having to make like substantive policy decisions. So even like which mechanisms, uh, you know, count or don't, like if, if they have to go down the path of, of specifying which mechanisms are are appropriate to use to do the validation, I think that's a little tricky for them too. So the more that can be cabined off so that they don't have to decide, the better. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, that is something that we can do though, right? Sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you can write anything in, in a draft and if they agree to it, then. Um, then they're clean. Right. <laughs> and it gets published. This, this is Brian. I have two conflicting thoughts. One, one is that you could appoint an expert and give directions to the expert to be very lenient, right? When in doubt, put it in. But but an expert can do things like look to see who who they, who they are and you know figure out who the actual um, uh, authority is in in a given country and figure out where there is conflict and blah 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 blah. You just let a person do the job, um, take it off of IANA, let an expert do it. Um, so that's one conflicting idea. The other conflicting idea is that when we faced a similar problem uh, in the emergency stuff, this is the thing called the forest guide, um, which is how you route a call internationally, an emergency call internationally. Um, remembering all of this issue that uh, John brought up about the enum thing, we said, look, they, they, these people all know each other, uh, and the carriers all know who the who the who the who the um, uh, regulators are just let them work it out themselves uh, and and don't have a registry so they'll figure it out they'll contact each other and they'll figure out who they trust and um, decide among themselves who 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 it is it's not clear that you need a registry I but last time I talked to Jim about this I told him to look at boss the Jim McEachern I mean yeah uh, I mean, especially because, I mean, Jim, Jim does have a separate ambition way outside the scope of what we're doing here, that for there to be some international organization, a kind of ADIS international that looks at this, right? And if like that organization is going to exist, then, you know, would, would, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a place where that kind of stuff would just be negotiated? <laughs> yeah. All right, folks, we're getting very close to our end of our scheduled time. Um, I'm willing to let the call run over for people that want to, to continue to talk, but I think we should officially close the official part of the meeting um, in, in the next couple of minutes. Does anyone have any other business items? There were, I know there were a couple of drafts that we had hoped to discuss, and I would encourage the, the presenters, the, the champions of those drafts, to um, send something to the list for now. Um, any anybody have anything else that they need to bring up while we're while we're still effectively in session? All right, I'm going to stop the recording. The meeting's closed. I'll leave the bridge open um, for anybody that was wanting to just continue the conversation that that, that we were in the middle of. Um, again, everything um, will be taken to list as 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 we move along so i am stopping the recording now